All right, everybody, welcome to another live developer cast here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel. I am, of course, Josh Placer, and we got a very interesting one for you today. My guest tonight was the lead designer on Civilization V, and since then moved on to make his own game and studio at Conifer Games. He's been in and out of the news over the last few years, and we finally got a chance to talk to him once again about what's been happening with his turn-based strategy game at the gates. So please welcome to the stream, John Schaefer. Hey everyone, it's nice to be here. Glad to be back. Hey John, it is a pleasure to have you on. It feels like it's been an eternity since we last spoke. How are you doing? <laughs> good, good. Uh, working hard on At The Gates again uh, after some time away from it for a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's been a while, um, both since uh, we've chatted and uh, since I started on the game. So I guess it, it kind of makes mm -hmm. sense to uh, come back around and uh, check in on things. Mm-hmm. And it's great to talk to you again. For those of you who are new, we've had a few recorded casts, like, what was it, like three, four years ago, we went like two to three hours long on design topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's always a lot to talk about, especially with strategy games, because there's so much design there to uh, to go into, so it's it's uh, there's always fun things to cover. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try and keep this under three hours if we can, but uh, <laughs> I hope you guys brought a drink with you or some food, because you may need it for this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it has certainly been a while since we spoke, and we'll be talking both about At The Gates in terms of its design, and kind of the challenges you ran into with the design process as well. And I'm sure as people start coming in, they'll probably have some questions for you too. If you want to turn on your webcam, John, uh, you can do that now. If not, they'll be looking at your little Skype profile. <laughs> I love my avatar, but uh, yeah, I think we're good to go on the uh, on the webcam. All right. We'll see what happens there. And I'm sure we'll get some more people in. Let's see. We'll play that been updated. So I know a lot of people have been looking forward to At The Gates, including myself. So I'm sure we got a lot of interest. And again, if anyone misses this live, we'll, it will be up in record form in a few weeks, as well as being early for my supporters over on Patreon.com slash GW right. Let me know when you're good to go with a webcam. Yep, let's do it. All right. Uh, feel free to turn it on. Uh huh. Yes, I guess I have to push the button, don't I? Yeah. Uh, this isn't as bad as the last one. We had Alexis Candy. Hey, John, there you go. Now we can see you. <laughs> Where he accidentally left the head, the volume on out, so everything was echoing the second I started talking, and he had to run to get a headset. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's yeah. There's always uh, something going on uh, when you try to record one of these things. I found uh, mm -hmm. from hosting a podcast of my own for about a year and a half. It uh, there were always technical challenges. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, to begin with, uh, since we have a lot to discuss for people watching us or listening right now who don't know who you are, could you go over a little bit about your background when it comes to the game industry? Sure. So I originally started programming uh, when I was very young, around 8 or 10 years old, when my father started teaching me. He was a computer programmer himself before he retired. Uh, and um, ever since then, I kind of wanted to make games, and in particular, I was passionate about history and strategy games. So it was kind of natural that I got into the Civilization series particularly and um, became a beta tester, um, eventually got an internship at Firaxis, uh, and um, once I got my foot in the door, I was really eager to work on uh, design projects on the side, so I made maps and scenarios and those sorts of things, and uh, kind of worked my way up, um, and then uh, was named uh, the lead on Civ Five. so um, made some pretty big changes to that franchise. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was... Uh, about time. Uh, Civ 4 was a great game, but we kind of wanted to uh, freshen things up a little bit. Um, and after that, I uh, left Firaxis, spent um, a little while at Stardock, uh, ended up moving on from there to uh, found Conifer Games and start on At The Gates. So I've kind of been in strategy games um, pretty, pretty thoroughly uh, and now trying to kind of put my stamp on the Forex genre uh, directly. Mm-hmm. 
And in during that time, you also ran your own podcast for a little bit as well, discussing game design. And, of course, you came onto mine several times. Now, are you still doing that podcast, or can people still find it? The podcast definitely still exists. Uh, I'm no longer a, a co-host for it anymore because it just takes a lot of work to do these sorts of things, and <laughs> my priority became at the gates. So, uh, yeah, it was... Um, something where uh, I was really excited to be a part of it, but um, it was just too much time scheduling every week, getting guests together, so um, unfortunately had to step away, but yeah, it's um, still around. Um, I guess I should mention the name of it. Uh, it was called the, or is called the Game Design Roundtable, so it has a Twitter account where um, I think the only thing that um, my co-host Dirk um, posts there are announcements of when new episodes are up, so you can go follow the Twitter account and see when new things pop up. Um, but yeah, a lot of good discussions with uh, game designers about various topics, so probably a pretty comparable overlap with this show. Mm -hmm. And don't I know about finding the time to schedule and plan these <laughs> things out? I've done, this week I had three including yours, and I think I got two planned for next week as well. So, it's a very busy time all around. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, uh, with that said, before we talk more about what's happened with At The Gates, uh, for people watching us again right now, what is the game for those who are just coming in or haven't heard of it yet? Yeah, so it's it's a game that I like to call a survival strategy game. So it is built out of the Forex uh, Civ-like genre, but uh, we're kind of making some big twists to that formula. Namely, there's a um, seasonal system, so instead of every turn being the same, uh, there's spring and summer and fall and winter, uh, and that changes uh, how the map works. So rivers will freeze, and you can cross rivers in the winter that you might not normally have been able to. Uh, and additionally, the food production stops in the winter, so there are both positives and negatives to the, the, the changing of the seasons. Um, you uh, start off the game as a migratory tribe, moving actually around the map with your settlement, so instead of spreading out and building lots of cities, you, you kind of are more focused on uh, your one specific settlement and keeping your people fed. Um, there's a focus on clans, so instead of just generic population points or units, uh, the clans have names and personalities. Um, they're better or worse suited for different professions, and they can uh, argue with each other, those sorts of things. Um, but the, the basic idea is to kind of push the 4X formula ahead, um, because there's just so much potential there that hasn't been tapped into yet. Um, I think pretty much every game that's come out in the genre has some resemblance to either Civ or Master of Orion or Master of Magic or, you know, those sorts of games from the early and mid nineties. Um, and, and we're seeing more innovation there now in, in recent years, but even so, I think there's, there's still a lot more room there. Uh, and this is, I think the kind of thing that Soren Johnson also was uh, trying to do with his new game, 10 crowns that mm -hmm. uh, was announced uh, a few months ago, I think. So, um, yeah, the idea is to try out new things, uh, kind of push the formula, um, and uh, see where we end up. Mm -hmm. I know I was going to Soren several times already. I think we had him on when he was making an uh, off-world trading company, which that was mm -hmm. a very different take on kind of like a quasi-real-time strategy game. Yeah, it was more of an economic RTS, so instead of uh, direct combat, they purposefully avoided uh, including that, uh, and instead you're competing economically. Um, there's a stock market, uh, there are resource prices that go up and down uh, based on in-game events and uh, who's buying and selling and uh, trying to race other factions to acquire resources on the map, that sort of thing. So it's, it's definitely very unique and uh, quite, quite a bit of fun, um, although... Uh, um, it is very much focused on multiplayer, I would say. There's a single-player mode, but it's the most fun in multiplayer, which I think is a little bit different from uh, a lot of other Forex games like Civ and the, At the Gate, certainly, which, yeah. you know, unfortunately doesn't have multiplayer, but it requires such a huge amount of effort that mm -hmm. was uh, a trade-off that we kind of, you yeah. know, figured made sense. Yeah. I know when we last spoke about At the Gates, I think you talked about inspiration from titles like uh, King at Dragon Pass or... So one of the older strategy games in terms of trying to create more of a personality to your units, as you said, as opposed to just, you know, nameless spearmen, nameless settlers, stuff like that. 
Yeah, and this is something that we'll probably get into a little bit, but uh, one of the issues early on in the development of Civ, or not Civ, <laughs> but uh, at the gates rather, uh, was having purpose behind what was going on in the game. So the, we had the uh, migration mechanic, we had the seasons, but um, because you moved around the map, you didn't feel like you were building uh, on the progress that you'd made earlier in the game. You kind of just had to reset every time you moved. Um, so I wanted to find ways to provide that same sense of progression, that same sense of building on what you had. Uh, and that's where the uh, idea for the clans came from. And that was inspired um, in part from games like uh, Crusader Kings, which were um, which had characters, and also um, King of Dragon Pass, which uh, characters play a very important role in uh, politically as well as um, uh, you know diplomatically. So um, that's something that we're going to be trying to push a little bit with diplomacy as well, in terms of having more story-like approach rather than just uh, this is a trade table and then you trade resources and make treaties. So um, yeah, trying to pull the idea of characters and personality and, uh, and kind of sp spread it more across the entire game. Mm -hmm. And as you said, John, we'll be talking more about kind of how the design of At The Gates has taken shape later on in our stream. But I think with that said, I know there's one question that's kind of the elephant in the room. I know if it, people watching will probably yell at me, and thanks to the magic of the internet and us doing this live, they can do it in real time if I don't ask you. And that is, what happened with the development of the game? And for <laughs> the new folks watching us, whether it's live or recorded, you originally did the Kickstarter for it. I think that was, what, 2013, 2012? Yeah, 2013. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you had plans of getting it done, I think, within like a year or so. And I know we were speaking about it around that time. And then, of course, as you said, you kind of took a break from it. And for a bit of a while, you kind of just like disappear off the face of the earth for a lot of fans. And I know, like, looking at the comments from the Kickstarter, there were unfortunately a lot of people cursing your name for a time there. And... Of course, you resurfaced, I think it was about a year, maybe a little later than that, uh, working at Paradox, and then, of course, you now working on At The Gates majority, uh, majority at the time. So, for those people watching us right now, I guess, what kind of happened during the span of developing At The Gates? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the... the... The basic answer is that I kind of burned out on the project um, and had to spend some time away from it. Um, uh, making a strategy game as complex as something like At The Gates, which is pretty comparable in complexity to something like Civilization or something like um, you know a Paradox game, um, more or less by yourself is kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it's something that uh, going forward with future projects, I'm going to be planning a little bit uh, differently in terms of uh, how work is distributed, um, because uh, when you're when you're an indie, basically everything is on your shoulders. And uh, a thing I've learned is that uh, I think I probably have about a three year uh, cap in terms of giving a just a huge amount of effort into a project and then after that I kind of hit a wall mm -hmm. um, and and the thing is like uh, you know when you when you do hit that wall uh, it's easy to fall further and further behind so yeah. it's you're trying to get progress done on the game uh, and you're spending time on that rather than uh, keeping up with the community and then you know that um, you know things are gonna be a little bit more negative so maybe you don't uh, spend as much time there as you should and then it kind of um, it all compounds on itself in a way and you just kind of need to step away. I mean, I think this kind of happens with mm -hmm. a lot of people in terms of a lot of different aspects of life. Um, but in particular with At The Gates, that was kind of the situation. And, um, um, yeah, I spent some time at Paradox and, um, you know, unfortunately that wasn't something that uh, resulted uh, in any games. Um, but it was good to kind of get my head out of um, where I was and get me thinking back in terms of getting um, strategy games built. And uh, I learned quite a bit while I was there. And then uh, now I'm busy applying some of those lessons with the uh, new energy on At The Gate. So we're um, 
wrapping up um, three big tasks that are left at this point, uh, which are diplomacy, the late game, and kind of general polish and bug fixing. So those are our priorities at this point, um, and uh, we kind of have a fixed idea of what needs to be done. And yeah, hopefully um, uh, no new surprises, but uh, on the plus side, uh, this is uh, going to be it for the, the feature list at least. So we, uh, we kind of have a good idea of what the finish line looks like. That's good to hear. And uh, what you're just talking about, John, regarding making that transition from studio to indie life is certainly a very interesting topic. I mean, that could probably fill a cast in of itself. But it's something that I hear from a lot of developers, whether they are first time indies or those who have made that transition, that it can be very hard when you realize that everything is now on you. There's not a team of people behind you to help with a project or to help mitigate any kind of risks that come up during development. Yeah, and things always come up. I mean, making games is really hard. And again, especially strategy games, I think, because there's um, there's not really a set plan that you can follow. Um, strategy games require a lot of iteration, a lot of testing, and then a lot of redesign, because ultimately, if uh, things don't fit together just so, uh, then the game as a whole isn't going to hold up. Uh, I liken it to a spider web sometimes when I give analogies, uh, where if you, you kind of pull on one thread, the whole thing comes apart. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, everything kind of needs to be done right, otherwise it's not going to be much fun, whereas in other genres you have a little bit more leeway. Uh, if you're in an RPG where, you know, the combat system doesn't work, that's bad, but it can still have a good story. Uh, it can still have good exploration mechanics. It can still have fun leveling, those sorts of things. And the game as a whole can hold up. Uh, whereas in a strategy game, uh, one system can bring down the entire game very, very, very easily. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's a big challenge and uh, something that is definitely um, very different um, from being an indie to having a studio. I'm trying to think now if there are any uh, developers who are kind of like indie strategy game developers, like uh, or, or solo developers, I guess. Um, we have a few people helping out on At the Gates, but I'd say probably about eighty to eighty-five percent of the work is is on my end. Um, mm -hmm. I know Into the Breach had a very small team, but that was still two guys and not just one. So maybe uh, maybe I am crazy. <laughs> maybe this, <laughs> you know, this was. Uh, going to be a, a challenging project uh, from the get-go, but um, yeah, no, it's um, it's been a long road, but uh, I'm actually really excited about the game. It's uh, honestly the only game that I've worked on that I actually truly enjoy playing just for fun, mm -hmm. um, which I think can be a bit difficult for strategy game designers because you kind of know where all the magic is, or, you know, there there isn't any magic, I guess, in some ways. Uh, um, you know, I imagine it's the same for developers of story-based games, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's something where uh, even when I play it, uh, you know, I have a hard time playing Civ now, but uh, at the gate still, even after these years, I, I play it and I say, well, you know, there is definitely something here, so. <laughs> and going back to a point you just said, John, uh, regarding finding the fun or getting everything right in a 4X game, or even just any strategy game. I know we definitely spoke about that last time, but it is a really good point about the tricky nature of this kind of design. As you said, with other genres, you can make do with like one solid core gameplay loop, or it's very easy to kind of see how the pieces fall into alignment. But with a strategy game, when you're dealing with three or four, even more systems all working together, it's it can be very difficult to kind of see where things are going to go. I know I've spoken to Chris Park about this from Arkin several times, but the problem or the challenge of strategy games is that it's not really a genre where, you know, your first prototype or your first build, you can say, this is fun, you know, I know exactly how this game's going to turn out. And these games, as you're no doubt aware, can end up in vastly different places from the original design. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, Iteration and playtesting is absolutely essential because no matter what your best intentions are or how well you think things through, it's just not going to work your first time through. So this is probably a key element to my design approach, which is iteration. And this kind of goes back to how Sid has developed games since uh, the early 1980s, where... Uh, he doesn't actually have any sort of design documentation whatsoever. 
uh, for him, the design document is the game itself. And obviously that can uh, make things a little bit challenging and in other uh, aspects of development. Like uh, if the artists need to know kind of what's going to be in the game, you kind of want a list of things for them to make. But, um, you know, in terms of pure design, especially if um, the designer is also the programmer, that's, I think, a, a pretty good approach to say, you know, the game is the game and the documentation doesn't matter nearly as much. And everybody has different work styles, but um, I, I think in a, especially a strategy game, you never really know what you're going to get until it's in the game. So you kind of have to be as flexible as possible. And, um, you know, this is one of the reasons as well why uh, the development of At The Gates has taken so long is because I you know, played it at various points and said, this isn't quite working and we need to do some things. And I could have just said, eh, well, we're going to ship it anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not really the approach that I like to take with things. Um, you know, I, I do definitely go by the mantra that, um, you know, a late game, even a very late game, <laughs> um, as long as it's still good, um, or great. That's what people remember. They won't remember the aspect of it being late. Whereas if the game is released bad, mm -hmm. uh, then you know there's no way around that. Uh, nobody cares about a bad game that was released on time. Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, you, you kind of want to find some kind of a balance there. You don't want you take six years to develop every game, but um, you know I think it is important to iterate and deliver something that's as good as it can be and how you define that will vary from developer to developer but um yeah it was uh a couple different points uh i played the game and i said it's not good enough so we need more time um and uh fortunately uh, people have been pretty patient about that even uh you know a couple years late but um <laughs> You know, I think uh, they'll be excited to uh, to play the finished version of the game when we're done here soon, and um, they'll see why uh, we put in so much work. Yeah, and as the saying goes, you can be your own worst critic, especially when it comes to game development. And I've spoken to many developers over the last few years about just how difficult it can be when you're trying to combine entertainment and programming together to make a video game like this. Because as you said, just because it works in your head or it may look good on paper or as a first prototype doesn't mean it's going to be something that's going to sell well or that everyone outside of your own circle is going to enjoy it. And it can be hard, I think, especially for the strategy genre, again, because of how abstract it can be, just to figure out, are people really enjoying this? Like, what is the point of playing this game and is it something that's going to make people want to come back to it or are they just going to play it one time and go eh that's you know it was okay but I'm going to move on to something else <laughs> yeah uh, you can be your own worst enemy but I think uh, a lot of times um, it's really helpful to take the approach of saying I'm going to develop this game I'm going to design this game for me and hopefully there are other people like me who will appreciate the same or similar things Obviously, uh, you know, a game will be interpreted differently by literally every single person who plays it. They'll have different aspects that they like more or less. Um, but as a designer, I think it's super helpful to say this is uh, this is a game that I get. Uh, and, and again, part of that comes down to actually spending time play testing because uh, it could be hard to find that time, especially for more complex or longer games. Um, I can only imagine uh, the difficulty of being in charge of you know, something like a 100-hour RPG or something like that, where playing a full game is basically impossible for the designers. I mean, that's, I don't know, two full weeks of work just to, you know, play through the game once. And, uh, you know, so it's... Um, it's something where you kind of have to balance it and say that uh, obviously you're making a game that you want other people to enjoy, but uh, if you don't enjoy it, if you're not passionate about it, if you don't see how things fit together and make this special, then uh, other people are going to be much less likely to. So, um, yeah, uh, for my uh, personal approach, I generally say I'm going to aim to make things up to my standards, which are really pretty high, uh, probably higher than they should be. But, uh, you know, hopefully that does uh, end up paying off here. Mm -hmm. And going back to a point you said a few minutes ago, John, I want to elaborate on for people watching, and that is making that switch from studio to independent development. 
because I know for my audience, I have a lot of people who are first-time developers or even students who are trying to make their first game. And one of the things I think that comes up is just what kind of challenge it is being an indie developer versus a studio. So the question is, what has been, I think, like the biggest challenge making that transition from working at Firaxis and Paradox and Stardock and being like your own boss at Conifer Games? <laughs> yeah, it, it's very, very different. Uh, and the, the benefits kind of go hand in hand with the drawbacks, namely that you can kind of do whatever you want. So prioritization can be a very difficult thing because when you run your own studio, you're running a company. So there are things like taxes and paperwork and, um, you know, like keeping track of trademarks and these sorts of things, you know, things that honestly I do not enjoy whatsoever, but <laughs> are kind of important part of the process. Um, and just also instead of pure design, there's a lot more things like um, answering emails, working with contractors. Uh, I spend quite a bit of time uh, coordinating all of our artists and programmers who are helping out on a contract basis. Um, uh, trying to get the word out about the game. Uh, you you kind of have to wear all the hats in addition to uh, just being a designer. So um, the thing I enjoy most is working interact interacting directly with the game but um, you know that's only just one aspect of the job so you, you don't have anybody that's going to tell you what to include or what not to include in the game I mean obviously at the gates is a good example of that but uh, uh, you know the downsides are that uh, it's all on you in the end um, you know you can't really lean on anybody else and you can't um, rely on the fact that uh, if I just get this list of things done then that's uh, good enough and I can go home and not think about it again uh, you think about it all the time. Uh, there's no getting away from it, and that's one of the reasons why it's really, really easy to burn out, especially as an indie, because uh, mm -hmm. things, you, you know, there is no work life and home life. Like they are yeah. combined in a way that is just fundamental. And that might sound like not that big of a deal for people, especially people who are really passionate about games, passionate about development, and uh, in particular younger and don't have families. But, you know, I've been now in the industry for uh, a little over 13 years and I used to be really excited about putting in 100 hour weeks like I honestly enjoyed it and felt that this is where I belong and over time you know it just it wears you down in a way that you don't expect and um, you know I, I burned up um, quite a bit after Civ 5 as well and um, had a hard time uh, getting back into development after that uh, so I think it's it's something where uh, you know the more you put in the more of a price that you pay uh, so going forward after at the gates and then just um, in, in the development time now uh, finishing up the game it's something that I'm very mindful of and, and trying to find a little bit more of a balance to say, okay, this is not something that I'm going to be working on every day until 10 p.m. Like it's just not something that's uh, a sustainable approach, even if it's something that I'm tempted to do sometimes and say, okay, you know, I just kind of want to work on this a little bit more. But, um, yeah, you, you have to be uh, smarter with your time in, in a way that uh, you might not um, ever even think about uh, had you not been in independent. Yeah, and again, it can be very tricky. I know for any students watching this about what it means to work on these games as an independent developer. As you just said, John, it is freedom. I mean, you can do whatever you want on a day-to-day -day basis, but as we've said many times over, you need to have some level of constraints. You need to be able to pull yourself in and say, I need to get X, Y, and Z done. I can't just spend, you know, 10 years of my life working on a game. Because we've seen, unfortunately, from the independent side, developers who become blinded by that passion. And it really is passion to work in the game industry. I mean, we've said this before, but nobody, this is not anybody's, you know, backup job. Nobody gets into game development as, you know, oh, I got to make games for a living. Woe is me. And that passion drives a lot of the best games. But at the same time, it's very easy just to lose yourself in the design process. And then what happens to this title when we're five, ten years down the line? Yeah, and 
it's something where I, I don't think I've known a developer, certainly not a lead designer, kind of game director level person, uh, who hasn't just completely hit a wall at some point or mm -hmm. just been completely exhausted or wondering why they're doing this or if they should keep doing this or, you know, wanting to step away or, you know, burning out. Like, it happens to basically everybody. So I think that is kind of indicative of something uh, fundamental there. Um, and not to say it's a bad job or something that uh, I'm unhappy with, but it is something where... I think especially once you are in a position where you can kind of call the shots either as part of a bigger team once you're further in your career or as an independent developer, you, you have to be really disciplined in terms of time management, in terms of kind of being your own producer in a way to say, okay, this is something that's um, that's a priority and this is something that's not. Um, and this is certainly something... Um, yeah, earlier in my career uh, and even all the way up through uh, the early days of At The Gates that I didn't put as much time or thought into as I really should have that I'm, I'm doing much more now um, whereas earlier when I was younger I would just kind of brute force everything and say well this wasn't uh, a feature that worked out but whatever you know I'm, I'm, I can make up for it like it was two weeks of work but uh, you know I'll just work you know late for the next month or two and that'll make up for it and and not even thinking about it in those terms but just like oh throw it out doesn't matter you know just keep going keep going like not even not looking back not looking forward just kind of grinding away on things and um you know again that's not a sustainable way to um either stay in the business be happy with what you're doing or to produce good work so uh, I, I do really think that uh, being disciplined is is a very important aspect to uh, to this kind of career mm-hmm and again, if we want to, we could probably spend like the next three, four hours on the design talks on At The Gates or Forex Strategy. But one of the major parts I wanted to focus the stream on, John, is something about like what happened in terms of finalizing At The Gates design, what went wrong, and kind of how you had to you know, steer the course or adjust your course or the development. Because as we've said before, for those of you who are fans of Game Wisdom, we can talk about games that have succeeded many times over. But it's a different story to talk about when a game is not coming together and kind of how do you do that course correct. Because again, game design is not something that is easily taught. And it's a very abstract concept that can be very tricky when you're trying to put into words, you know, what did you do? Like, it's very easy in interviews to say, oh, I spent, you know, I made the game good. Yeah, that, that's a really educational way of describing things. So, uh, we've already talked about the basics of At The Gates earlier in the stream. But for right now, John, I guess, during the development, where, I guess, where, like, the first major stumbling block occur during its design? The first, uh, the first big one was definitely just um, feeling like the game was a little bit empty. So there were mechanics, you could move units around the map, you could fight, uh, there were resources, you could train units from your settlement, you could move your settlement around. Um, there was a map that was procedurally generated, it had the season system in it. Um, we didn't have victory conditions yet, but it was, um, you know, like the, the, the fundamentals of the game were there. You could play, you know, for several hours. Uh, and um, just kind of experience what the game had to offer. But um, it didn't really seem like there was that much there. Like you, you kind of didn't have much that changed from game to game. Um, you didn't feel like you were making much progress. Like uh, your, your uh, tribe looked basically the exact same 100 turns into the game as it did on the first turn. Um, you had uh, new technologies and these sorts of things. But, uh, you know... It wasn't, um, there wasn't a, a whole lot there fundamentally. So um, this was something that came out um, through playtesting. Um, you know, this is something I'm going to get back to again and again here probably. But uh, uh, that was uh, the point at which I said, you know, this this game needs some something fundamentally new and different in order to make this work. Because if we just ship this, like people will play it, have fun for maybe an hour and then say, well, that's pretty much all there is here. It's like a cool concept, but it's not really a good game. Um, and this is something that I could have caught earlier in the process had my, um, my, my design investigation been more thorough. And I think that's something that, um, you know, I'll be 
accounting for certainly in the future. Uh, that's one of the things about this job as well is that you're always evolving and adding new tools to your toolbox. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's, po again, possible to go too much in the other direction and put too much on paper and say, this is going to work this way. And then you implement it and it doesn't work that way <laughs> or mm -hmm. it doesn't feel fun. So what do you do then? I think there's kind of a balance there between finding the identity and the purpose of different features and then actually testing that uh, as, as quickly as you can to see if that actually works. So we basically stepped back and said, this isn't working. Uh, we need probably a lot more time to figure out how to make this work. Um, and that's ultimately what we did. Uh, and that was where the clan system was introduced to the game, where, uh, again, you get these uh, named um, individuals or groups of individuals who have different personalities, and you can train them in professions, and uh, they level up in different disciplines. So a clan might be... Uh, a farmer, so they're in the agriculture discipline, and then they're over time leveling up in agriculture, uh, which allows you to more easily train them in more advanced agriculture professions, like um, I don't know, like a, uh, like a baker or something like that. Let's say. Um, so it's um, this is pretty fundamental element of the game because it touched uh, the combat system like the individual units weren't generic population points anymore they were actual clans uh, uh, it touched the economic system of course it touched uh, how the tech tree worked uh, previously the tech tree was very simple there were like 10 things now there's closer to 100 professions in the game um, so it was it was a pretty fundamental shift uh, and Again, like the the process that I went through originally wasn't thorough enough to catch this sort of thing in the early going, and it, and it should have been, and it will be in the future. But uh, I, I do still think it was the right decision to say, okay, we need to step back and take more time, uh, even if that costs us a year or two, um, to make this right. Because, you know, again, my, my priority ultimately uh, being an independent developer is to put out the best game that I can. Uh, were I running a studio of 10 people and if we didn't have that money to pay the salaries, then that would be a much more difficult situation, especially if you can't find further investment. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think being an indie is kind of a good thing because you do still have that freedom and that control to say, I want to do this, even if it's probably not the greatest idea financially, but you know, my personal pride in terms of a developer, in terms of being happy with what I put out is important enough that I will you know, assume that hit to my pocket and assume that hit to my reputation in order to make sure that uh, we put something good out. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, again, one of the advantages of being an indie and also one of the prices because uh, you can end up in uh, spending two more years on something that uh, who knows how well it'll do. It might not do very well. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a tough business sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> And from what you were describing in terms of the general play of At The Gates, at least before you did the redesign, that it sounds like it ran into an issue that there just wasn't a lot of variance in between the different plays of it. And we see this in a lot of strategy titles. I know Civilization has been fighting this as well, where once you figure out what the best build order is or the best strategy for you know where map placement or where you're on the map, the game just kind of plays itself over and over again. There's just not enough differing elements to say that this game is going to be different from this game that's going to be different from this one. And I've played my fair share of strategies, I'm sure you have as well, John, that just feels like once I've learned it, it's like, why should I play it again? Like, there's just nothing to keep me coming back. Yeah, for sure, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make At The Gates and why the, one of the reasons why I've been so adamant about making sure that uh, it's done you know, right, quote-unquote. Um, because, I, again, I think there is an opportunity here to do something new, to do something um, <clears throat> that's better in a lot of ways. And so I didn't want At The Gates to end up being something that was just, okay, you know, it's a good game, but whatever. You know, it's it's basically like Civ, except uh, it's a little bit different here and a little bit worse there. Uh, I wanted to kind of push things in a fundamental way. Uh, and again, how much will that end up paying off in the end? I think um, we're going to have a really good game 
uh, that we ship here. Uh, I think the game is already really good. It's just a question of how much better and polished can we get it. But um, yeah, it's um, you know how well will it sell? We'll find out. Uh, hopefully that uh, that extra effort uh, will end up paying off. And if it doesn't, then you know maybe the answer is to uh, to kind of focus on on different things. But uh, uh, for now, you know I'm I'm definitely very adamant about. Um, Mm-hmm. trying new things and then doing them well and uh, maybe that maybe that's a little bit too uh, a little bit too ambitious uh, you know it's it's you have games uh, from companies like Blizzard and Valve which in in a lot of ways aren't revolutionary but uh, evolutionary mm-hmm. um, but when they do them they do them exceptionally well and everybody understands and respects what they do um, whereas other studios are much more interested in in kind of pushing the boundaries and trying new things, but also there are a lot more misses as well as hits, and uh, polish is often something that kind of uh, um, doesn't end up being a priority. So you know, trying to do both again with uh, basically a, a one man team with uh, some contractors helping out on the side uh, is it the best idea? It's probably not something I would recommend, but you know, games can be a tough business in the first place. So if you if you wanted something that was a little bit uh, more stable and a little bit more friendly in terms of your uh, in terms of your personal time, you probably shouldn't be in games in the first place. So I guess uh, a lot of people will kind of understand where I'm coming from there. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about this before on these streams about the difference between that refinement and that uniqueness that we see between AAA versus the independent side. And you're right there, John. Like companies like Blizzard they're not going to make something completely outside the box, but they will release one of the most polished and iterated versions of that design. And sometimes that can be more than enough. We've talked about before the quote-unquote, you know, the Blizzard charm or that Blizzard magic that they apply their games. Same goes for somebody like Nintendo. But from the independent side, we have seen, I know for myself personally, I've played some fantastic games over the last eight years from the independent game side, but they're not going to, I'm not expecting, you know, Unreal Engine 4, you know, AAA graphics or, you know, completely bug-free titles. And as you said, there have been many hits and there have all, unfortunately, been many misses as well. And again, if we want to talk more about independent game development, that's who knows how many more hours we get into. <laughs> Yeah, and every company can kind of decide for itself what it wants its path to be. I mean, uh, I certainly had options to hire up and build a proper studio and find investors and publishers and do that sort of thing, but I really did value the flexibility of saying, like, this game does need to be better. I'm going to spend more time and, you know, spend my own money trying to make sure that this game is as good as it can be. Uh, So for me, that was a priority. Um, I'm also fortunate to be in a position where people know who I am and are interested in the kind of work that I do, Um, whereas it might be a lot more difficult for people in other positions to kind of take that uh, take that jump and go in that direction. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't um, I don't uh, begrudge anybody who kind of goes down the other path to say, all right, well, we kind of have to prioritize. uh, getting the game out the door a little bit sooner um you know but uh yeah for me i i I have these priorities and uh it's gonna be hard to uh pry them out of my hands i guess (laughs) now going back to what you were saying a few minutes ago regarding the play testing or trying to spot when things started to not feel right for you we've again like I said, this is another common thing about these cats. Like I've spoken about all these topics so many times before. But with a game like At The Gaze or just strategy design in general, obviously the core gameplay loop of what you're doing from minute to minute, that gets established very early on. And then it's always the extra systems and that integration that is when the, I guess, the magic happens in the strategy genre. So... With the work you did on At The Gates and the playtesting, like, how did, like, your vision kind of get, you know, out of control in that regard? Considering, again, that when we spoke, like, four years ago, you had a pretty good idea of, like, the moment-to-moment gameplay of At The Gates. Yeah, and I think a lot of the individual mechanics are still very similar. The, the problem is that they just didn't add up 
to anything beyond like okay i played this game for a period of time and you know what kind of something you were touching on earlier like why do i come back and play again what am i doing differently what's what's um spicing up the experience and there was also something else i touched on earlier which is just the the concept of progression and feeling like you've accomplished something um and this is something that's very fundamental in a game like Civilization, where seeing your empire spread across the map, uh, founding new cities, seeing farms uh, appear on uh, different tiles and connecting everything up with roads. Like there's a very visual sense of what you're accomplishing here, the the buildings that you construct in your cities, the seeing the output of your uh, cities increase over time uh, with the help of those buildings and with more population and specialists and different things. So there, there's a feeling like you're building something, that you're growing, you're expanding, you're doing more. Um, and these were things that uh, I just kind of took as a given, I think, um, coming from a base that was similar to civilization. But those things are not necessarily baked into the the core formula of units moving around a procedural map um, and those were the elements that uh, that we had and the focus in particular on the migration and the focus on resources and the focus on um, the seasons uh, didn't by themselves add up into something where you felt like you were making progress um, so because you had to keep moving, there was there was nothing that you fundamentally felt like you were building up at the time. So, yeah, it was it was something that um, ultimately came in a lot of ways through playtesting feedback from other people. So, as a designer, it's super easy to kind of get tunnel vision and then not particularly realize what's working well or poorly in your game. Um, you know, I think it's essential for the designer to playtest their own game but it's also impossible for them to have a clear and objective viewpoint on it. So you need to get outside feedback, um, you know, how, whatever form that takes, if that's a beta test, if that's a QA, if that's, you know, just getting uh, friends who can provide good feedback, uh, you know, whatever you can do to get more eyeballs in the game because everybody's going to have a different perspective and you're going to get feedback that you just never thought about. Somebody might say, you know, I just don't think that, this part of the game is very much fun or like you know what do, like what am i trying to do here or like oh yeah i never bothered with this aspect of the game because like it just didn't seem that interesting um you know those are very high level things and there's also a lot more specific details that can come up through play testing like i didn't understand how the the resource system worked or something like that um but all of these things um you know can can kind of derail you in a lot of ways um so i think you know, especially the longer development goes on, the less um, clear vision that you, as a designer, have regarding your game. So the more important it is to get outside feedback. So that was kind of the point at which, um, you know, when, in a game like At the Gates and a game like Civilization, it just takes a lot of time and effort to build that fundamental base that uh, you need to play. Like just getting like unit order queuing and like pathfinding and all these different things just to get the very basics of the game up and running that takes quite a bit of time and work so it takes you know a while to get the game playable uh, and that's going to be very different from let's say like a platformer in unity where you get the basic uh, physics down you get some levels together uh, and then suddenly you can jump around and see you know is it fun to jump around and move through space here uh, in a game like civilization or at the gates it takes years of work to get to that point where you can say okay we're moving things around here like you know in in a realistic situation like what does that look like what does that feel like so um yeah, you, you, you really need to get that uh, outside feedback and then, um, you know, be mindful of what genre you're in. I think uh, in a strategy game, yeah, you kind of tried to need to pull lessons in as best you can from other, other games. But, um, you know, the quicker you can get to play testing uh, both yourself and other people, I think the better off you are. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, continuing on that point, one of the additional challenges of a strategy game is the fact that you usually have these different phases of how the game goes through. You have the beginning, the middle, and the end. And they can have very different aspects of what the player is focusing on, what the goal is. And it's not something that can be easily playtested. As you said a few minutes ago, like if you want to playtest a platformer, 
you can put a level down from someone's hands. They'll play in 5 to 10 minutes. You'll get feedback. But if your game is like a 30, 40 hour strategy game where you're going through these different areas and different phases of gameplay, it becomes a lot harder to get that feedback of how your game is transitioning from beginning to end. Yeah, for sure. It's it's a it's a completely different challenge um, from other genres, specifically action genres, action games. Um, and that's you know one of the reasons why people like strategy games is because it takes time to unpack them to figure out how things fit together or you know in some cases not <laughs> uh and um i think this is also a reason why we see uh extended development cycles uh why we see expansions and patches and um pretty rough releases in strategy games generally i think it's just kind of hard to avoid um ending up in a situation where the, not everything fits together quite right and it just takes time and feedback and iteration to uh, get things in a good place so um, you know strategy games are a pretty pretty enormous challenge um, I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen too many 4x you know Civ like games ultimately is just because they're incredibly difficult to 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 make even even a, to make a bad one <laughs> let yeah. alone a good one so um, you know, again, we're seeing more and more uh, examples of these in, in recent years, but uh, it's still nothing like, uh, you know, platforming or shooting genres where uh, there's there's qu certainly quite a bit more competition. So I guess for somebody like me who, who can um, effectively produce games in that space, it, it's kind of a nice advantage in a way. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's a reason why um, you don't see that many games out there. It's just kind of tough to make them. Mm -hmm. And when we last spoke about At the Gate several years ago, I know <coughs> boys are starting to cut in and out there, but uh, when we spoke last few years ago, you talked about kind of trying to figure out what the end game was of At the Gates. And since we last spoke, I guess, what has happened or has anything happened in terms of how does someone finish a run of At the Gates? Yeah, this is... Uh an aspect that um, I've been focusing on quite a bit more in the, since I started picking up work on the game again, which is specifically uh, what is the structure of the game? So what, what are you doing in the mid game and what are you doing in the late game? So the clans um, kind of gave a, a structure to the game where you, you have something that can build up and progress and something that added some dynamism to the game. Um, but it still didn't solve all of the problems that we were having. Uh, so the uh, the basic idea now is uh, the game is split up into three, you know, roughly similar, uh, similarly long segments. The first uh, part of the game, the early game, is the migration phase where you're moving around the map, you know, basically as I've described already. Uh, the second phase of the game is when you settle down and construct a kingdom. So instead of moving around the whole game, you now spend the first third of the game moving around. Then you find a good base uh, to kind of settle down in, and you permanently fix your, your settlement in place, and you found a kingdom. Uh, and this costs some resources, but it gives you a big bonus to fame, so you get a lot more uh, clans showing up that you can use um, for different things. Um, so this also coincides with a, another change where um, there are now uh, two kinds of structures uh, and three ways to collect resources total, including those two kinds. So you, in the very early game, you forage, uh, you send clans around that just kind of pick stuff up. Uh, then you start building structures out of wood, and then finally you start building structures out of stone. And the stone structures are permanent. They don't deplete the resources on the tile in the same way that uh, wood-based structures and foraging do. So there's a transition period from the early game to the mid game where you settle your kingdom down, you start building structures out of stone, um, as a player, you kind of have to decide what the pacing of that's going to be uh, when it's worth uh, investing in stone because it's it can be quite expensive. Um, but, for example, in a recent playtest game that I was doing that I've been kind of detailing on the Kickstarter is um, I found a gold uh, deposit uh, near, you know, not too far away from my starting location. And I said, you know what, this is, this is going to be a pillar of my kingdom. I'm going to make a, a stone-based gold mine here that's going to last forever. I'm going to have all this money that I can do whatever I want with, um, buy lots of stuff at the caravan. It's going to be great. So that kind of became the basic focus for this game. 
Uh, and so a lot of the early game was structured around trying to figure out how to get this stone-based gold mine online um, because that would kind of be the, the foundation for everything else I was going to do after that. So that's kind of what the mid game looks like now. So there's there's definitely much more uh, of a firm footing um, for the, the gameplay to rest on. It's not just wandering around and doing stuff. Uh, the late game, uh, and this is something that I still need to implement, is going to be focused on fighting the Romans. So you migrate, you settle down, you build a kingdom, you build up, and then now it's time to fight uh, and defeat the Romans. Uh, and this can be something where either uh, you go for them or they come after you and you hold out. So the, the specific details there, um, I haven't worked out the, exactly, but the, the basic idea is, you know, if you want, you can send an army to Rome, take them out, and then that's one certainly very direct way of winning the game. But uh, there's a sense of uh, building tension over time where you know that eventually it's going to come down uh, to a fight, and then... Uh, the late game is going to be concentrated on that relationship. So um, there's now a pretty clear arc to the game in terms of what you're doing in each phase uh, and uh, what your priorities are. So this is, uh, you know, a problem that uh, definitely uh, hung out there for a little while, but uh, it's something that I, I feel pretty good about our solution now. Mm -hmm. And two points I, I was thinking about as you were describing that, as a trash truck is driving right outside my window as well. <laughs> uh, the first thing, as you said, when we last spoke, the game was definitely more about that focus of there was no real hard villages in At The Gate. So it was just about that constant migration. You never knew you know, where resources were going to be. You never knew how long you could really stay at one spot. And it sounds like from what you're describing, it's now more or less like similar to Civilization or to other strategy games that once you find that spot that's kind of you're going to stake your claim and that's going to be it for the rest of the game is that right yes once once you get to that phase of the game so it, we we kind of found that uh, the, the migration and hunting for resources thing worked up to a certain point but once you got far enough into the game it was like okay how far do I have to go like oh, another tribe like already went through this area and cleared out everything, like what am I going to do? Um, you know, there, there, was, there was certainly a fun aspect to the migration element of the game, but it wasn't something that we really found could hold up over 200, 300 turns. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, you know, kind of a decision that uh, I, I think made sense because... Uh, again, also, you, you, you kind of want there to be a sense of progression. You want there to be a sense of accomplishment. You don't want to just kind of be doing the same thing over and over again. And, you know, part of this also goes back to the the fundamental concept. Like, what am I doing in this game? What is the fantasy here? Uh, and the fantasy is I'm a barbarian tribe kind of progressing towards the Middle Ages. What does that involve? You know, running around Europe, trying to stay alive. Oh, okay, now uh, we're the Goths. We're settling in Spain. Now we're now we're Spain, and we, you know, have to fight off the Romans or we're the Ostrogoths in Italy, but now we're the Italians, and we've taken down Rome. Uh, so from a historical perspective, this is an arc that kind of makes sense. Um, and it, it's also something that I think can be explained pretty clearly and straightforwardly, which I think is kind of important, um, especially in these more sort of sandbox games, because, um, you know, civilization has kind of gotten away with it. It's kind of cheating almost in a way uh, where it's like, what is the point? You know, what is the goal when you're playing a game of civilization? And there's never really been that great of an answer, like build a spaceship okay you know conquer the world okay you know that's that's pretty straightforward but that's not really the goal of playing civilization um and it's certainly not uh something that every player is interested in doing um but yeah like i said civilization has kind of gotten a pass there because it's been around forever and you know so many people just kind of know oh civilization is the game where you play through history what's the point to play through history mm -hmm. you know there's what is the objective there eh you know have fun um, it's it's not as uh, direct as um, Paradox's approach in terms of, yeah, there there's just no victory condition, period, and we're happy about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in a game like At the Gates, it makes a little bit more sense to have kind of an arc to the game because it is a more distilled historical period rather than just, you know, play through history. Um, you know, play play as barbarians and, like, run around Europe 
could be interesting, but it's not as appealing hook as like, you know, play as barbarians trying to survive and build a kingdom and take down the Romans. Like, okay, you know, that that's something that kind of makes a little bit more sense right off the bat and is more evocative in terms of, okay, this is why, that, that does sound interesting as opposed to, hey, you know, let's just run around Europe and try not to starve. Okay, hmm, all right. Mm-hmm. And the other point I wanted to bring up is the idea of differentiating your design in these different phases. Because, as you said, when it comes to a lot of strategy games, I think one of the weaknesses, or one of the hard things to do, is, as you said, keep one design focused for two, three hundred, four hundred turns. And I know with Civilization, there's always been that challenge of combating, you know, the infinite city sprawl. Or the fact that your mid-game just devolves into the same thing for who knows how many turns and we have seen a few strategy games i've seen stuff like um i think elemental i know there's more out there that try to break things up by saying once you've hit this phase you're now doing this and everything that you've done before you're not going to focus on that anymore and it kind of splits your game up into like two or three different kinds of design in a matter of speaking yeah it's it's pretty tough i mean i think we have kind of an advantage because we're turning something new which is kind of the core of at the gates into something that looks a little bit more like civ which has already been done so it's i think a fundamentally easier problem than starting from the thing that you know and then going into something completely new um you know we've already kind of done the hard part i guess if you will uh but, uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, civilization has shown that there is a, a fundamental weakness in terms of um, just the arc of that particular game. You know, everybody, I, I don't know, I don't think I've talked to anybody who likes the, the, the late game more than the early game. Like, not a single person. Um, and I think part of that is that, uh, you know, the design could be better. But also just from a fundamental perspective, like, you know, 4X games are about exploration, expansion, exploitation, and extermination. Well, which are the two most fun Xs? It's the exploration and expansion part. And in a game of Civilization, realistically, you're done exploring and done expanding yeah. about halfway through. Mm -hmm. So that leaves the last two Xs, which aren't as much fun. So, you know, just from a fundamental perspective, like, you kind of have a big problem that's going to be really difficult to solve in a game that's about all of history and i think uh in 10 crowns this is something that soren is going to be doing a little bit differently like in the in the initial description i think it, it talked about it just being uh you know 10 crowns like uh ancient and medieval so he's basically saying hey we're gonna not worry about the uh the 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 industrial and modern eras here. We're just going to focus on the parts that are fun. And I think you can do that in a new franchise. You can do that in a new game, but you can't do that in a game like Civilization. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, if you made Civilization 7 and in uh, 1500 AD, <laughs> people would go crazy, even though nobody really likes playing after that, really. I mean, some people will still enjoy it, but nobody will can say that's their most enjoyable part mm -hmm. of the game so it's you know it's it's a tough thing um uh but again you know i keep going back to it but i think there's a lot of uh, fertile ground here to uh, try out new things and i think uh, we're gonna see some really cool games yeah and i know i'm the same way with civilization with any a uh, turn-based or forex strategy game where the first you know core of the game is the most exciting the most interesting because you're trying to figure out what your plan is but then once you've done that then it's just I'm just going to go on autopilot for the next 50 to 100 turns to enact that plan, and then game over. Do I really want to do that all again? But conversely, as you figure out with At The Gates, it can also be trouble just to focus your game on that one aspect. Because as you said, when it came to the original vision, where it was just about the exploration and expansion side, can that really hold someone's interest again and again and again, and then take it over a hundred plus turns of play yeah it's um you know and and this is one of the, the the challenges of trying something new i mean most new 4x games that aren't civ stick pretty close to the formula um you know well i guess i would say <laughs> all of them actually stick pretty close to the formula in in some way or another uh 
and trying something new. Like a lot of a lot of times, these lessons that seem pretty obvious uh, later become things that uh, aren't visible at the time. I mean, you know, the concept like uh, when we did the Kickstarter, people were really excited and. You know, some people asked about like, oh, what are you going to be doing in the mid and the late game? But it was never like, oh, yeah, this this concept clearly like <laughs> there's nothing to do and nothing interesting after you've played two hours, one game. You know, it's like something that became clear after the game was there and playable was not clear when it was just a concept. Um, and, you know, I think that is a difficult lesson to learn, but it is, you know, something that uh, I think can be can be noticed a little bit more with um, with a little bit more planning than I put in the first time around. But also, again, you know, sometimes you just don't know until you've played the game and 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 found all the all the flaws. That's just kind of how it goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, just to stop things for a second for a quick time check, it is about two twenty my time. We've been going for just about over an hour. Do you have to hard stop in the next ten minutes, John, or do we have a little bit of leeway? I think we can probably go about 20 minutes more. Okay. All right. In that case, we'll begin to wrap things up. I have a few questions I want to get to. I'll throw it to you as well if we missed anything. For the folks watching this live right now, I'm going to put a last call out. If you have any questions for John regarding game design or at the gates now. But, yeah, we'll probably, I think I'll, I think we'll probably use those last extra 20 minutes, but we'll wrap it up at that point for you. Okay, so, sounds good. Uh, getting back to things, I, I think one of the more interesting aspects, I'm sure you're no doubt aware when it comes to strategy design, is again, what it means to, why do you keep playing these games? So you've you touched on this and you elaborated on it several times already, but as you said, with something like Civilization, it can be very hard to nail down why do people keep coming back to it? And again, this is one of the advantages or disadvantages, or I'm, I'm sorry, both, of an established strategy genre. I know people who have played probably hundreds of hours of Crusader Kings 2 or Europa Universalis because of you know that kind of storytelling aspect. Just as there are people who have spent, you know, Civilization is, you know, their, is akin to their Madden. You know, there are people who they will just buy the one Madden game every year and then that's it until the next year comes around. And this is both a combination of design and, of course, iteration, but trying to get that magic, or again, that that element of what keeps the game interesting is tough. Because as we said, strategy game design is not the same as an action game or a first-person shooter. It's more akin to the roguelike genre, wherein it's not about designing a game that's really great on one playthrough. It's a design game that's really great on 15, 20, 30 different playthroughs. And it can be very hard to get a design that is both unique enough for that single playthrough, but still malleable for repeated ones. Yeah, and I think the focus here, I think this kind of applies with uh, other games that are highly replayable, regardless of what genre they're in, including things like shooters. I think your focus really needs to be on two things, on on system design and then on emergent gameplay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a lot of times that can either, the the second of those can come through uh, procedural generation, either of maps or resources or loot or whatever, um, or... um, having kind of humans running into each other if you think about uh, something like uh, you know battlegrounds like one of the things that makes that game replayable is that you're playing against lots of people and people act in different ways and some people are really good and some people are really bad and crazy and you know <laughs> there's just there's a lot of unpredictability and I think that that emergent element of like this game is going to feel different from the last time I played it is really what separates um, you know these these sorts of replayable games from games that are p- more purely story based or more purely about just uh, straightforward progression. Um, and I think that the systems design element is also pretty essential there because uh, just trying to do something that um, you know 
like just having procedural maps isn't enough. Just having multiplayer isn't enough. Um, this is one of the reasons why I spent so much time on uh, the map generation in Out the Gates because I think it, it has a really essential role to play uh, in this in this element of replayability. Like, do you start near a desert? Do you start in a in a big forest? Do you start somewhere in between? Like, each of these games will feel very very different, especially when that. Uh, those elements become layered with other sorts of systems like uh, the resources like okay now there's different resources available oh now there's different clans available oh okay you know maybe um, another leader um, is putting pressure on you so this game goes a bit more military or maybe you pop a goodie hut and then you find a free explorer so then uh, you do this other thing in the game so it kind of uh, you know the way these systems uh are designed, particularly how they layer over one another, uh, is, is pretty important to that replayability as well, especially in strategy games. Um, I think in other genres, maybe it's a little bit less important, and you know, s systems overlapping is kind of the the keystone of, of strategy games compared to something like uh, a, a game like Battlegrounds, where uh, more of the replayability replayability comes from improving your skill and then playing against lots and lots of people. Um, but in strategy games, particularly, uh, getting those overlapping systems um, behaving well with one another such that they all kind of feed into each other, um, I think is pretty important. So those are kind of the two things I would say are, are pretty fundamental elements of uh, making a good replayable game. Yeah, And a lot to unpack there. My brain is starting to go into overload with some questions. <laughs> I have to be careful or we'll be entering like hour eight or nine of this discussion. <laughs> But uh, three big points I want to touch on, including what uh, Dol uh, Tolman said in chat. The first one goes back to what you were just saying regarding strategy games are typically built on the moment-to-moment -moment and, oh, I'm sorry, not moment-to-moment, -moment, the systems design and emergent gameplay. But one thing that we don't hear too often, this is one thing that always stops me from really getting into them, is the fact that there's not really a moment-to-moment -moment focus on a strategy game in the same way as you said with a game like an action game or Battle Royale, Fortnite, you name it. Wherein, when you start playing a game like this, you're involved from minute one. And this is one of the things I think has always been one of the differing appeals from action to an abstracted based title. When I play God of War or Devil May Cry or anything like that, I'm involved from the second I pick up that controller. I'm in, I'm invested. I'm I'm sorry. I'm invested in the gameplay. I'm getting that feedback loop immediately. When I play a strategy game, however, that's not the case. You're not going to see how things evolve, evolve or grow in you know 30, 40 turns from now. We've I know we've mentioned this before on previous casts, but that whole idea that you can lose a civilization game at turn 10 and you didn't realize it until like turn 75. And it can be very hard and very overwhelming for new players when you're trying to learn a game like that where it's not about what you're doing now. It's about what you're doing now that's going to impact you, who knows, an hour and a half to two hours in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, there, there are certainly things that designers can do better there. Uh, I think part of that is interface, part of that is you know, tutorial, uh, <laughs> either a direct tutorial or just uh, in-game help, um, uh, and just how things are structured, how things are presented to the player. Uh, but I think some of that is just fundamental to, to the genre. I think uh, you know, the need to plan, the fact that things play out over time, is just something that's kind of baked in and you know you there's going to be a learning curve no matter what uh, designers can try to smooth that over but yeah until you see how things fit together until you see how those systems are overlapping until you see the spider web mm -hmm. um, the game isn't really going to come together um, and that's you know I think it's it's certainly a challenge and it, it's something it would be nice to say hey let's wouldn't it be better if strategy games had all of this depth and complexity complexity and replayability uh but they were super easy to get into like a platformer or a shooter <laughs> you know obviously that would be great uh but i just don't think that's uh i don't think that's realistic i don't think that's possible um i, I think from that depth comes a certain requirement for 
yeah, you're going to be kind of wandering around a little bit in the early going. And, and this is something that even even I myself as a strategy game designer experience when I'm playing some other games. Uh, when I first get started, I'm like, I have no idea what this does, what's going on here. And of course, I kind of have the handicap of um, you know nitpicking things and saying, hmm, they really could have made the tooltips in this game better. Uh, but uh, you know, it's 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 something where I think uh, that reward, um, you know, comes from the hard work that you have to put in early on in a lot of ways. Um, and you know, can we smooth the curve? Yes, but I think it's it's kind of fundamental. Yeah, and there's also why another core tenet of game design is that, as we've all know, you save the first level. The first level is done last in terms of its overall polish and iteration. And the same goes for tutorial design. And you don't want to use the tutorial you came up with, you know, during alpha as the same tutorial when your game is done. Because as you said, you're still trying to figure out how these systems work and more importantly, where people are running into those pain points with your title. And that's something that you're never going to figure out on your own, as you alluded to earlier in the cast, John, with the idea that you know you're you're kind of seeing the man behind the curtain. You know how everything works, and it can be very hard to figure out just why people are getting confused or stuck at certain aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, you know, and this is this is something that kind of works against uh, these big long strategy games as well, is that. Uh, because that early game is so important that um, you really do want and need to spend a lot of time on it. But this is why the late game basically always sucks, uh, is it just doesn't receive the same amount of time, uh, both in terms of design time, um, in terms of polish, and in terms of uh, playtesting, um, in part just because it takes a while to get there. Um, but uh, yeah, and you, that early game is so important, especially in a strategy game, because it is already hard to get into. It is already, there is a big learning curve. So you need to be particularly diligent about, okay, what is this first 10 minutes, hour, five hours look like? Because if it's not good, then you're not going to really have anybody to play your game, like regardless of how good it is 50 hours in. Um, you know, you, you, you can still build up an audience. I mean, games like Dwarf Fortress have obviously proven that uh, you don't need the most uh, polished, slick presentation in order to build up a pretty good audience. But, you know, imagine if uh, there was a game like Dwarf Fortress that uh, was a little bit more presentable in the, in the early going, you know, not just graphically, but just in terms of, like, how you play, how you get into things. Like, what is the fun? How do you get to that part without needing to watch a YouTube video or needing to read a, a guide somewhere on the internet? Um, you know, and I think there are uh, examples of games out there that have kind of shown this working. Um, you know, you look at something like uh, Minecraft, and I think they kind of tapped into that formula a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, just what you said there regarding a more uh, polished or iterated version of Dwarf Fortress. That was one of the things I was so excited about when I saw Space Base DF9 from mm. Double Fine a few years ago. And again, it's very hard sometimes to get these designs going. I mean, again, we could easily segue into talking about, you know, PUBG versus Fortnite and how much Fortnite has overtaken things, thanks to, like, the slight change in terms of design, and of course, the major difference in iteration and polish that Fortnite brings. And sometimes that can be that unique selling point. And, but when it comes to strategy games, again, it's not about the polish, or it's not about the sheen, or the ooh and the ah when you play a strategy game. Because... As we've said many times over, strategy game players, we're not interested. Like, you can't really put a screenshot of a strategy game up and say, oh, look at this, you know, buy this game just because of a map and watching, you know, a borderline. It's not the same as when you're watching someone play PUBG or Fortnite where, you know, the whole, or even Call of Duty, the 360 no-scope, you can put a screenshot of that up and that can sell a game. But a lot of what sells a strategy game is the un or are the underlining systems, and as you said, the emergent elements that can come about it. But it's very hard to exactly say, you know, tell someone this is why you're playing my game or this is why I'm selling it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is uh, this is 
you know something else that's kind of baked into the strategy genre it's just kind of hard to sell at a first glance or a short impression like uh you know regardless of what that looks like if it's a screenshot or a gameplay video or even like a booth at a game show like e3 or pax or something um you know like if it takes two hours to really get into what makes the game fun mm -hmm. then that's just going to provide a, a barrier to entry that's going to you know, limit uh, how many people, um, you know, jump into the game. And I think Civilization shows, like, uh, you know, over time, once you kind of build up a, a name and people know what you what you have to offer, that you, you can be pretty successful. Um, but still, like, uh, compared to, a, you know, like, the, the top-selling shooters, I think Grand Theft Auto is something like 90 million copies on Grand Theft Auto V, which is just insanity. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think any... Uh, digital strategy game is ever going to do something like that just because it's so hard to like see what's cool about it, it, it you know really quickly um, but uh, you know you, you, I think as a developer you have to be patient in the same way that uh, players have to be patient uh, and if, if people know what the what they're going to get if they're going to get a good game from you then uh, that should be hopefully enough over time <laughs> yeah now, I know we are starting to run into our time, and there's so many more questions I have for you. So here is my last question, and then we'll go into our final our wrap-up period for the cast. But I'm going to combine this with what Tolman said earlier. A few minutes ago, you mentioned, of course, that making a game replayable is very tough. Just having procedural or randomly generated elements doesn't automatically make your game have a high-level replay value. And this is something that I agree firmly with. I'm actually working on a post about that creating variants in games. And one of the problems, and one of the things that Tolman also touched on in chat, is the idea of quote-unquote flipping the script. The fact that it doesn't matter if your game features a procedurally generated map, if I'm still doing the same 10 things in the early game, or if I'm just doing the exact same things all throughout the title. Yes, I may go left instead of right, or maybe I'll start near a mountain or start near a forest, but I still have an itemized checklist of, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to found my city here, I'm going to research this, 20 turns later, I'm going to do this, 5 hours later, game done, I win. And creating those elements where the game feels legitimately different is tough and again this goes back to what you said earlier that trying to make a game replayable enough that I can still enjoy it five games in or a hundred playthroughs in is very hard and to combine this with Tolman's comment about with At The Gates like what have you done or what are you thinking about doing to make each run feel legitimately different or allowing the game to essentially again quote unquote flip the script on the player so that I don't have this 50 bullet point checklist that I'm going to do game in again 500 games down the line <laughs> I, I think um, an essential element here um, is the playtesting and the iteration like a lot of times you just need to play what you have and say you know what would be cool is if I had an option here to do X um, because I think At The Gates is a really good example of a game that uh, early in development uh, you know early the first couple of years honestly um, the game felt very very much the same every time you played you know regardless of what was going on now things feel dramatically different in based partly on the terrain based on the resources based on the clans that you get um, and really it didn't take a lot of fundamental changes to reach that a lot of it was just the specific things like okay a clan like when new clans show up they have two traits and those traits are randomized and maybe prior to a clan showing up you had a plan to train the next clan as a farmer or something but then the next clan shows up and let's say it has a really big advantage for the discovery discipline and you know making you could make them a surveyor in one turn instead of like six suddenly that's a big new opportunity that says oh maybe I should do this or maybe they have a green thumb and they get like some kind of small penalty for agriculture and you're like oh you know mm. 
well, I could make them a farmer still. Uh, there's a small penalty for it, but um, you know maybe it's better if I try to adapt and I do something else differently. So you don't you don't punish the player too much for uh, these these sorts of random situations. Uh, like I, I think it's best to present opportunities rather than kind of forcing players into something like. You know, I was I was just thinking about random events the other day, um, and there are no random events in At the Gates, but it's something that uh, could be introduced in some way uh, down the road. And that's, you know, one example of a bad random event is, oh, suddenly uh, half of your food supplies just got eaten by rats or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, <laughs> you know, like that will change how you play, but you're also, like, annoyed by the game, and you're like, can I reload? Uh, maybe I should just stop playing. Maybe I should start over. Maybe I should just go play that other, you know, new game that came out. I'll go play a new Civ expansion or something. Like, you know, you have to kind of be careful with how you how you play around with things here. So, as a designer, I, I try to present opportunities more than more than just kind of hit people over the head with a hammer and say, oh, you should really be doing this. Um, but those opportunities, like part of it, does come from randomness. And again, linking that with opportunities rather than like, hey, you get smacked. Um, but sometimes those things do come out of ideas from playtesting, where you say, oh, you know, if I had some option to do this thing with the gold in this game instead of what I did, oh, maybe, okay, yeah, if I add this profession here and I change the cost on this, and you know, you you can kind of add you can kind of add these elements once you do have those fundamental systems that allow for that kind of complexity. Yeah. And for at the gates, it was absolutely essential to get the the clans introduced to the game and have those clans um, have these these couple of randomized uh, personality traits that completely added a whole new dynamic to the game that that's really added a ton of life to it. Um, and before that, I mean, the, the random map was there, the resources were there, but it, it really took that last, that third piece to kind of add uh, the final layer that made everything work together. That essentially add in the variance and letting the game essentially grow differently each time you play it, I guess. Yeah, and you always will have new clans arriving and they will have two traits and you don't know what they're going to be. And most of the traits are good. Um, some of them are bad, and and sometimes, and this is this is actually an interesting comment I've received where some clans are just flat out bad. They have two traits that are bad, um, and a lot of players, well, not a lot, but I, I would say at least four or five players have said, "Hey, can we have an option to like like maybe clans have one good trait and one bad trait, or you know maybe there's some way of like getting rid of a clan or trading it in or something." And I thought about it, and I've decided, you know what, no. I like the fact that there are some clans that are just horrible. Like, they're super, they're super rare. I mean, you know, you might get one a game. Uh, you know, if, if half your clans were terrible, then that would probably make the game unfun. But if you have that one clan, you're like, oh, these guys, like, they, they just keep committing crimes. Like, they're, they're bad at everything. It takes so long to train them. Like, ugh! Like, I think that's actually kind of a neat thing. I think there there can be an element there uh, that works. Um, but you have to be careful with it. You can't go overboard. You can't have that situation where half your clans are that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, yeah, having having I think having a system like that where you can inject personality, uh, add little bits of randomness, um, and have these things that also provide opportunities to players. Like, um, I think characters uh, in whatever form they take can be an essential element to that recipe, and it's something that I, I'm almost certainly going to continue exploring in, in future games. Um, but in At the Gates, in particular, it, it really added a, a whole really cool dynamic element. Mm-hmm. So whenever I get a chance to play At the Gates, so you're saying that I won't have the chance of getting like three quarters of all my clans will be bad ones. Are you saying that I won't? My luck or bad luck won't get involved there. <laughs> I suppose it's theoretically possible. Uh, you might be you might be the guy on the very bottom part of the uh, bell curve, uh, but if you do, I want a screenshot. So, uh. Uh, well, when I played uh, XCOM from uh, Jake Solomon, I got I was missing ninety five percent shotgun shot one time, and when I played Renowned Explorers, I missed a ninety nine percent success rate, and that one I did make a little video because. 
I broke <laughs> the. I think I broke the bell curve on that one. <laughs> Excellent. All right. I, I we need to we need to get you in here and uh, and see what happens. I will break the game entirely there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, my last point again, if I'm not careful, I'll just keep throwing in last points. But one thing that I wanted to touch, my final thing I wanted to add, and this kind of again goes back to what you said with random randomization. And what Tolman said is that when you start adding in these elements that can change the game or kind of, again, add that variance, it only does lead to the game essentially telling its own story. And I think this is a very under, underrated aspect of not only good strategy games, but any game where you kind of put the player in control. Any, I am sure for the folks watching us right now, they have probably have played XCOM many times or know about it. And one of the more popular aspects of XCOM has been making the after-action reports or making these stories that evolve from the gameplay. And I think this is another part of the emergence, emergence that can happen. And I'm sure what you've, you've probably thought about is at the gates is how these elements kind of create an element of storytelling of what I'm doing and then how that's being inferred on by the game or what the game is basically leading me towards over how many turns I'm going to be going through it. Yeah, and this is where I think uh, procedural uh, structured randomness comes mm -hmm. in um, because I think all the games where, where um, you have those really interesting stories, different things can happen. Like it's, it's uh, you know, sometimes it involves another human character, mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm hard pressed to think of any game where there are really good stories where there's no randomness and no other human players. Like you, you could say human other, playing against other humans is kind of like a, a random number generator in itself. So you know, games that have no random elements whatsoever. You know, mm -hmm. if you kind of know how everything is going to go or you can kind of forecast it, then you know what's yeah. Uh, you know, I guess I guess maybe uh, if you kind of screw up or, you know, elements of skill are involved, uh, I guess there can be uh, something there as well. But, you know, at least in strategy games, um, you know, I think that uh, smart use of randomness is, is really important. Um, I think it can be used really sloppily and clumsily, like, A, we, we roll a die and uh, you lose half your food. Uh, that's no good, mm -hmm. but... Um, oh, you know, we rolled a die and you a new clan showed up and they're really good at this thing. So maybe you want to do something else instead of that plan that you had for what you're going to do with the next clan. Like, oh, okay, you know, this this could be an interesting uh, story element that uh, kind of pushes you in a different direction. So I, I think smart use of randomness is is pretty yeah. essential to that to that whole part of uh, making making those stories <laughs> shine. Exactly, and it's one of the reasons why I love the buying of Isaac, because as you said, like I know the beginning and I know the end of a buying of Isaac play. What I don't know is how I'm going to get there, mm -hmm. and all the little things that can affect the variance or affect what I'm doing creates a huge amount of variance in those runs. I've said this before, I have played over 100 hours of the buying of Isaac, and I've never had the same exact run play out twice. And it's little things, and I'm sure as you're figuring out with at the gates very little subtle touches can make your game very replayable but as you say if you go too far if it's just like a hammer or like a you're using a, a nuclear bomb to hammer a nail then it can end up those situations where i play the game oh no random event half my money has now been sold or you know tax man comes takes half my money i'm now screwed it's like yeah that was random but what does that exactly do for me now? To be fair, uh, Tax Man is definitely not random. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But um, with that said, I know we've gone over our time. And again, we are we could be here for another two to three hours like it's nothing. So before I get to my final series of questions for you, John, is there anything regarding At The Gates in terms of its design or its redesign that we haven't touched on that you want to bring up now? Hmm. I think I think we've covered all the major points. Um, I guess, um, yeah. One of the interesting elements is just uh, victory conditions. Like, how mm -hmm. how does a game wrap up? And this is something that we talked about uh, briefly earlier. But um, you know, I've always kind of been of the opinion that uh, 
the the game is kind of its own reward in a way where like when people play civilization they don't really play it to win you know some people do of course but i would say the majority do not and even for people who you know try to win once or twice like they would still say like you know the run up to victory and and trying to win the game isn't the most fun part so you know it, it brings up an interesting design question of like how how do victory conditions fit into a strategy game because i think in some games uh, if you look at something like into the breach like winning or losing is almost kind of everything like can you mm -hmm. finish the map uh in the time limit that you have uh before really bad things happen or get worse uh, you know so it's 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 something that uh you know i'm going to be continuing to think about going forward but uh, in at the gates i kind of went uh, with more of a straightforward approach like okay well uh you know the the end game is basically fighting the romans so that's that's going to be it's going to be kind of what we we focus our time on i also thought about other things like diplomacy and an economic victory but you know is that something that really fits thematically not particularly so it's you know, it's something that, uh, you know, I'll probably be putting more thought into in the future, but it's it's still something that I think is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. It sound, it kind of reminds me of Simiar's Colonization, where the end game is, of course, uh, the Revolutionary War, and you dealing with Great Britain coming over. And it's very interesting how, like, those uh, major or super events that kind of dictate play. I know uh, Paradox of Solaris has been doing that with having these mega events that one can spawn, and then that kind of creates your end game going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think something like that can definitely work. Um, it's still it's it's still difficult. Uh, I think because it, it's kind of new territory. I think this is one of the elements of Forex um, uh, and Grand Strategy that's seeing some interesting experimentation now. Um, and I think we'll again we'll continue to see that going forward. But um, yeah, I, I don't think anybody's really quite figured it out yet. Um, you know, having a, a mega event kind of shape your late game works mm -hmm. for a lot of players, but some players, especially more competitive people who like to plan further in advance and have things be more structured, uh, don't really like it as much. So it's you know there there, there are some trade offs there on the design side. Uh, and you you kind of just have to decide what kind of game you want to make, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe the formula will become a little bit more standardized in the future. Mm -hmm. But again, if we're I have so many more questions for you, John. But I know we have a time difference here, and I do have to let you get back to design the game. So <laughs> it is time to begin to wrap things up. So. Uh, with that aside, I just have a few logistics-related questions for you, and then we will say goodnight. So the first one is, I guess, a very simple one. In terms of where you're at with At The Gates, I guess, what's, like, left? Like, what's your plan, uh, I guess, in the coming months for the title? Yeah, so the, the focus right now is diplomacy, um, and then the last two big things after that are the late game, uh, getting uh, um, fighting the Romans down after you've uh, established your kingdom, uh, up and running and getting that uh, working well and then uh, polish and bug fixing so we, we don't have a fixed uh, timeline uh, at this point but those are uh, definitely the last things on the list now uh, I was just working on kind of the production side things uh, the uh, milestones and task lists and stuff um, dates are kind of up in the air but uh, in terms of the specific work to be done we we have a pretty clear idea now finally so that's nice um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, once we once we have some more ideas in terms of dates and stuff, uh, I'll be I'll be uh, certainly announcing that on the Kickstarter and the website and Twitter and whatnot. So everybody will probably find out. <laughs> Do you think you'll be able to get it done by the end of 2018? Uh hopefully. Uh, but it it might uh, it might be early next year. I don't know yet. Um, um, late in the year is difficult um, time to release things. Cause People uh, tend to spend their budgets, and uh, reviewers are busy doing other things and that sort of thing. So uh, it could be a good time to get in some extra polish time. But ultimately, um, the main thing depends on what the status of the game is. Uh, we don't have to print boxes out, and uh, we don't have big marketing deals or anything lined up. So it's it's more really uh, what's the uh, right fit for the game. All right. 
And I guess, are you planning doing like an early access on Steam or will it remain like a close or invite only beta? Um, for now, we're uh, keeping uh, things uh, specific to our website, so no Steam early access. Um, my philosophy there is kind of twofold. One, uh, um, I think in, I would prefer players to be playing the finished best version of the game rather than uh, playing an earlier version. I think this is especially important for strategy games where, again, you have that spider web of systems that all kind of need to be working for the game to really be fun. Um, you know, I think that's a little bit different from more of an action focused game where half of the levels can be done, they're great, and then you come back and play in a year or whatever, and the other half of the levels are done. Um, that's not really how strategy games work. Um, and then also, just um, you know, from a business perspective, like ultimately, you you have like one launch event when everybody says the game is out, let's go get it. Um, and if you do Steam Early Access, then you're kind of uh, splitting that in half. And then I think that's uh, ultimately going to cost you in the long run. So I think both for the players and for the business side of things, it doesn't really make sense for uh, for uh, this kind of game. Mm -hmm. All right. And again, so many more things we can touch on, but I do, mm -hmm. I'm trying to resist the urge of asking you like 20 more questions yeah i will i will be back on again don't worry we can <laughs> uh you can make a list and uh we'll go back <laughs> <laughs> all right well i think with that I'm trying to think if there's anything else last minute regarding at the gates we talked about the early access we talked about uh plans i guess one last thing in terms of the platforms you're aiming for uh besides of course steam uh, i guess what other platforms will at the gates be available on yeah, so um, in terms of uh, operating systems, we're looking at Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, and then uh, in addition to Steam, we'll be uh, on the Humble Store. We're actually already um, available through Humble on our website, which is at thegatesgame.com. You can actually get an advanced copy of the game now um, and play it. Uh, although, again, like I said earlier, I generally would recommend uh, waiting until game is actually finished because it will be better and I think playing a better game is is better <laughs> um, and uh, GOG and you know maybe some other places as well but the, uh, those are the things that we're uh, we're pretty sure of right now alright well I think with that we'll wrap things up my final thing then for you John do you have anything you would like to say to the fans or any final thoughts or closing thoughts for us well, it's uh, it's certainly been a long ride. Uh, it's been a fun ride and uh, and a hard ride <laughs> uh, at different uh, various points in the process. But uh, no, I like I said earlier, I really do think this is uh, is a great game, and I think um, people will understand why uh, I took all the extra time to make sure that it was done done properly um and yeah it's it's certainly appreciated the, the amount of patience that people have had uh, sticking uh, sticking around uh, staying interested and uh not uh, not beating my door down uh, physically at least um, um but yeah uh, looking forward to uh, getting the game wrapped up uh, like i said earlier we uh, have a pretty fixed idea of what is left to do uh so We'll see how long that takes. Uh, hopefully, not too much longer. Uh, we'll get this game out the door, um, get people playing it, and then uh, on to new fun things too. Awesome. Well, again, John, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. It was great catching up, and hopefully, we'll be able to talk again in the next forty years. So hopefully, we won't wait <laughs> that long. <laughs> I, I would imagine we'll be able to fit something in. All right. Best of luck to you with wrapping up at the gates. I can't wait to check it out. And like I said, when you're free again, we can, again, we have so many more topics we can easily jump off into. Yeah, no, we'll we'll get it done. It sounds good. All right. If you and my hang on Skype for like one minute after we close the stream, I have just a few quick questions for you. But other than that, that is going to do it for our stream tonight. So once again, I'd like to thank John for coming on. Um, are there any places you would like to plug before we wrap up for like if they people want to find you or stuff like that? Yeah, uh, I'm on Twitter, John Schaefer Design, spelled J O N S H A F E R, and then the word design. Um, you can find the game at um, at thegatesgame.com, uh, and I also have a personal blog where 
I post uh, updates uh, for the game as well as uh, some design stuff occasionally at uh, johnschaferondesign.com. So, um, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, you'll find me on Twitter. So, yeah, check me out there if you're interested in my, uh, my thoughts on different things. Great. So with that said, we are going to end things here for this live cast. Thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in live or watching this recorded. If you're watching this recording and would like this ad free and early, be sure to check out patreon.com slash GWBicer. But other than that, we're going to end things here. I will be back on later tonight for regular game streaming, and hopefully we'll be able to talk to John as the game gets closer to being finished, because I definitely want to touch back with you regarding design and, of course, how things wrapped up. Sounds good. All right. So with that said, once again, thank you for tuning in. Have a lovely Tuesday for everyone watching this live, and I will see you all again later. Until then, take care.